Hello all. So, just something quickly before we start. I'm usually reluctant to dive into causes of any sort, but Mrs. Owl found this one, and bloody hell, man. So, there's this kid, Captain Corey, on YouTube. After, I think, two failed heart transplants, he is now on palliative care and as an aspiring YouTuber. Before he passes away, he really wants to try for 100,000 subscribers in order to get his plaque. Plaque? Plaque. Either way, why not stop on by his channel and drop him a sub or two and maybe some kind words. I've linked the channel in the description because Damn it, man. This one made me vueco levels of sad. Anyways, on with the show. Hello all, this is the Owl, and... <laughs> oh yeah, you wanted jump scares, you got them. Before we start today, I would strongly recommend checking back in on Christmas Day, as there will be kind of an important announcement. You'll see what I mean. So. When I first started this channel, way back in the dusty days of earlier this year, I made a terrible video on Fuan no Tane, and a slightly less terrible but still pretty bad video on Fuan no Tane Plus, its sequel series. And since you asked for it, it's Masaki Nakayama time. This guy is a bit of an enigma in that I'm never sure how much of his writer persona is just him doing a bit, and how much is genuine. A Hokkaido-born family man, and a lover of campfire stories, urban legends, traditional Japanese folk tales, and allegedly a believer in the supernatural. For most of his career, Nakayama worked on manga that nobody's really heard of, while also releasing the two, well, now three, Fuan no Tane series, two of which I've already covered in their own videos, and one of which I'm really tempted to redo, to, you know, make it good. However, the thing that Nakayama is best known for is our subject today, his magnum opus, PTSD Radio, also called Aftermath Radio in some quarters. Much like his Fuan no Tane stuff, it's less of a coherent narrative than a sequence of vignettes and short stories. Small horror-focused set pieces with a heavy emphasis on the scares, although this time if you squint hard enough, there is a bridging narrative and themes that emerge as the story goes on. Although this is not an easy one to follow, and even after reading it at least a half dozen times, I am only really starting to put the pieces together. Let me just say this though, at this point, if you haven't read PTSD Radio, stop this video right now. Don't worry, it's not going anywhere. 
go out and buy this thing. I am deadly serious. Read it, enjoy it, then come on back. Because despite its flaws, this is an absolutely phenomenal and highly deserving both of your support and attention manga. Okay, done? Great stuff. Let's get a wiggle on. I spent the last few mornings reading through Nakayama's pretty lengthy blog, and I learned some rather interesting things. Firstly, he is a traditionalist in terms of manga. Everything is hand-drawn, which these days, yeah, I cannot help but admire. This guy isn't just a horror writer, he is a big believer in ghosts, curses, and the supernatural in general. And this is where the story gets outright creepy. See, according to Nakayama, this manga became creepypasta levels of cursed. Not just for the reader, well, aside from the I need new underpants curse, but for the writer and his staff. And, I guess, for the publishing magazine as a whole. A curse so severe that Nakayama had to abandon the manga. Once again, hashtag allegedly. But, as this is a Nakayama thing, and he isn't big on standard narrative structure, I am going to honor the man by cutting that story off here and saving it for the end. Don't worry, we'll get back to it. Now, last thing, before we get rolling, I am not going to be looking at every single vignette. Some of these are great, some of these are a bit weak, and many of them are outright inexplicable. I will also warn you at the outset that this is the scariest manga I have ever read. I am not kidding. Anything that can make me a boomer-ass middle-aged man with a beard you could hide a chicken in do a full mid-air 180 at 5 a.m. Yes, I get up bloody early to work on these, because the fireplace popped must be doing something right horror-wise. So, let's take a look. As you can see here, the collections and stories are broken up with weird, abstract interludes, often creepy, surreal, progressive images, as well as text and occasionally a nod to the themes of the stories to come. I'm not going to be doing all of these, but it is a fun extra and really does add to the eerie atmosphere the story is trying to build. Our first is a short vignette of a rural town, and a young girl reluctantly having her head shaved by her grandmother, as apparently is a tradition in this town. We then see her, older, napping on the train, but she senses something wrong and wakes up. She then turns and is startled to see that there's something wrong with her reflection. Something very wrong. The shaven figure starts to turn to face her and... Yeah, a bit of pee came out. I won't lie. The first time I saw this thing, it scared the living hell out of me. There's something just so wrong about seeing a reflection of your own face, only distorted and now malicious. That freaks my damn balls off. It's a story beat that Nakayama seems to like, and yeah, 
When it comes to making me twitchy while I'm getting ready for bed, this works like gangbusters. We get a few short vignettes involving people seeing freaky apparitions which appear to be made out of hair. Well, mostly out of hair. Ugh. Something supernatural has evidently awakened in Tokyo, and it's starting to make its presence felt. We see that Chifuyu, the girl from the start, is experiencing more and more nasty events, as a mysterious force will sometimes grab her hair and then drag her around by it. At one point, nearly drowning her in her bathtub. Later, Chifuyu meets with Keita, her ex-boyfriend, and we see that she's shaved herself bald. Keita thinks that she did this due to a nervous breakdown after he broke up with her, but she's actually done it to protect herself from freaky invisible hair pullers. According to her, the evil force only appeared after Keita entered her life, and as he protests, her face begins to twist and warp, and she tells him that whatever it is that he gave her, she's giving it back to him. Sure enough, a bit later, his new bird has something grabbing at her hair, leading to a pretty funny scene where she thinks it's him being an ass, gets annoyed, and kicks him out. So we now have our two, well, the closest we're gonna get to main characters, Chifuyu and Keita. These two don't really have much growth or an arc or anything, it's more that they form the common nexus of most of the creepy stuff to come. The progressive images between chapters are getting very southercore, and this little bookend technique reminds me quite a lot of some of the old Robert Swindle stories. Speaking of things that nobody else remembers, damn it, but those books were good. Our next little vignette involves a dour looking kid, Hamaguchi, who's being bullied by some upperclassmen led by Nakata, a right nasty piece of work. They want to shave his head. Noticing a theme yet? Hair! What is it with Japanese horror and hair? Hamaguchi begins to freak out, then suddenly smashes his fist into the ground with enough force to shatter the bones. The bullies are nonplussed and horrified as the now maimed boy walks away, but Nakata is stunned to silence as he sees what actually happened. Hamaguchi wasn't trying to hit him, he was trying to hit his shadow. Ooh, that's not good. Now, let me warn you at this point. It may often look like actual stories are being set up with characters and arcs, but very little of this ever gets explained. Some of it gets straight up contradicted, and the bits that we do get are still very abstract and very weird. Nakayama is much more about mood and scares than telling a coherent story, and I think a lot of this is saved by how frigging good the art is. I mean, just look at this next bit. Damn it, that's impressive. And yeah, I am a sucker for horror stories set in rural places. As someone who grew up on and around farms, it's a great setting and it's not one explored anywhere near enough. Oh right, I'm also going to be futzing with the chronology of some of the stories to help them make a bit more sense. And that's gonna be a job of work as bloody hell. Not only is this a story that's already confusing, 
and is seldom spelled out for the reader, it's also told completely out of order. One story will be in the past, the next one will be in the present, the next will be further back in the past, and then we'll have two at indeterminate times. So I'll be doing a lot of guesswork here. If you have your own thoughts on what the actual bloody hell is going on half the time, I would love to know. Hit me up in the comments. A bunch of kids out in the country find a strange object in a crow's nest high up in a tree near an ancient temple, and they manage to bring it down. It's an ornate wooden box, plastered with seals. Yeah, I can't make out the kanji here, but the message is clear. Do not open. So, of course, they open it, releasing what seems to be a torrent of thick, greasy hair, and <laughs> this nightmare fuel is at the bottom. What the hell is that thing? Well, it gets explained later. Kind of. Not really. We cut over to a school where someone has written the word Ogushisama. Sir Big Skewer? No. <laughs> Apparently, this means God of Hair. What a wonderfully off-putting term that is. And it's being written by, I think that's Nakata from earlier, who's now in a full-on fugue state. We also see that the kids who opened the box are now being followed by a small, shadowy something. Eep. As the interlude segments get spoopier, we see a traditional Japanese family at some point in the past performing a ritual. They hang shears on their door and then warn their son not to touch them. I wonder if this is supposed to be Keita as a kid, but sure enough, that night a shadowy figure approaches and in the morning, a bunch of greasy black hair is left on the floor as the family prays to Ogushi-sama to leave them in peace. We also observe Chifuyu as a child, seeing her mother's funeral rites in another rural town. Or is it the same town? I'm not sure. Where her head is shaved before they put her into a casket. The hair is then sealed in a familiar box and placed in front of the ominous idol of the god worshipped by that village. I'm guessing this is Ogushi-sama, and this idol resembles a twisted Jizo statue. This statue is found by another group of kids at an indeterminate time later, and we also see that Hamaguchi has some kind of connection to the statue, or maybe he's possessed. I have no idea, and no, this is never explained. But I do maybe see what Nakayama is driving at, at least from a vaguely thematic standpoint. Jizo are usually cute little statues with a vaguely sad or sinister meaning, especially if you know what they represent. Jizo are the guardians of children, particularly young children or babies who've died, which is damn, and they are supposed to hide the souls of these innocents in their robes to protect them from the various demons they'll encounter on their journey after death. If you want to know more about this, check out part 2 of my Nature of the Netherworld series. Jizo are an interesting example of Japan's distinctly unique spirituality, a fusion of ancient Shinto and naturalist beliefs 
combined with Buddhist philosophies. And to all of you Bleach fans out there, Mayuri's weird-ass Bankai is actually supposed to be a corrupted Jizzle. But this is something interesting to note about Japanese spirituality, particularly the more traditionalist sort. Gods are seldom benevolent. They don't really care for mortal kind over much. And that's the best case scenario. At the worst, they can be cruel or callous. It's generally not a good idea to draw their attention. And for the most part, you'd be better off just avoiding them. If you do run into one, or find out that one has some connection to your home, you generally want to give them an offering to appease them, so they don't take it upon themselves to follow you. And this closes out Volume 1. Volume 2 opens with some meditations on hair, and its occult significance in Japan, which I'm not going into right now. I did talk a bit about Japanese occultism in my third Chainsaw Man video. If you've watched that, you'll recognize the specific attire used for cursing someone. So, people both worshipped Ogushi-sama, or at least used the deity as an intermediary in regards to the afterlife, but they also used it for curses. Huh. And, yeah, Volume 2 is where things start getting rather confusing, as Nakayama starts jumping around in time. First up, we go back a ways, to the time period, just after Japan's surrender at the end of World War II, as a soldier delivers some hair from a dead comrade to his family. We then see the family is in the Ogushima town, and they perform a funeral rite. This implies that Ogushisama was at some point in time at least vaguely benevolent. We'll see more of this later in the story, but we also see that the hair was just a mix that the soldier grabbed from a barbershop in, I'm guessing, a well-intentioned but ill-advised attempt to help his dead friend's family feel better. It wasn't the hair of the person in the ritual. I wonder if this is what pissed off the god. We then move to, I think, I think it's the present, and we rejoin Kata. Oh yeah, we're now back to the good scary shit. This vignette is vintage Nakayama. Sometimes, at night, a dark figure appears in his room, staring at him. A mate of his comes over and has a good laugh, glibly suggesting that since the figure is female, Maybe it just wants Kata to throw a bone into her. However, Kata tells the chap that he can ask her for himself. Uh-oh. He turns and sees... Welp, I'm not getting any sleep tonight. Bloody hell, that is terrifying. We then hit another theme. Crows. Oh boy, I'm not going too far into this, but the crows in Japan are their own thing, and also gigantic dicks. Extremely smart, completely fearless, and they come in enormous flocks, sometimes blanketing every telephone wire or rooftop gutter, all watching you intently just in case you produce something edible or shiny. It can feel honestly pretty terrifying, and is probably why so many Japanese folks have a phobia of birds. No, I'm not kidding. Hell, when you put out your garbage in Japan, 
you have to stick it into little sealed sheds just to stop the crows from getting in and then strewing it around the neighborhood. However, common wisdom in Japan is not to attack them because they share information and may just decide to get some payback. A mistake that this chap makes when he leaves his garbage out and sure enough, the crows come down and have their fun. In anger, he throws a rock at them and, ha, huh, impressive, actually manages to land a hit, only to have the crows begin to gather and stare at him. Welp, chap, I think it's time to move, maybe to another country. Sure enough, wherever he goes, he is now followed by an ever-growing murder of crows, just watching him. Roar. Yeah, I love the idea of this vignette, but I don't love where it goes. Oh, the next bit starts well, but eh. One night, he wakes up and looks out of his window, only to see a whole bunch of crows staring back at him. That is freaky. But then he realizes that these aren't crows. I guess they're supposed to be hair monsters. As I said, eh, it would have been scarier if they just stayed as crows, because coming and spying on you at night is both kind of what you think crows might do and also what you really hope they don't do, but it's also just what monsters do. Yeah, as I said, I'm not a fan of this twist. Things tick along, and we get some more random, spooky vignettes. A group of female students find this abomination in their class, and when it looks at them, yeah, nope. I'm not sure what this creature is or why it keeps popping up in the story. I just want it to go as far away as possible. Again, nope. A woman in her apartment is haunted by an apparition that she thinks is her dead grandmother. I'm not sure if this is supposed to be Chifuyu, but it would make sense. Regardless, she wakes up one night find it standing in the corner of her room. It then turns to look at her and... Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Our next bit is a slightly longer, honestly more of an actual short story, and probably one of my favourite parts in the manga. We cut way back to 17th century Japan. A bunch of folks find a door that someone threw away, emblazoned with what looks like a horrible, furious female face. It turns out that the door is part of a local legend, and according to this legend, it moves around on its own at night. Over drinks, we see some watchmen figure out that the door might actually have come from a whorehouse in the red light district, and one of the older men tells them a ghost story about it. This is actually really interesting, as this entire segment takes the form of a classic kwaidan, a traditional Japanese campfire ghost story, which, yeah, I adore. Japanese campfire stories are amazing. There's one in particular called The Cow, which, 
if it wasn't for the drip 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 story, would be the scariest campfire story I'd ever heard. Regardless, a prostitute fell in love with a samurai, who, I guess in exchange for free sex, promised to buy out her debt and claim to love her. Yeah, I'm not going to go too far into this, but this whole samurai prostitute thing is a plot beat extremely common in stories from the era. The prosy took him seriously and waited, giving poor service to her other customers until she stopped getting any at all. But as it so happens, the samurai had neither the means nor any real intent to actually fulfill this promise. As the story goes on, a few other men interject, as they've all heard variations on this story, and one of them pipes up about his own experiences at that whorehouse. He went to a prosy that may very well have been the woman from the story. The day after, she was found murdered. While no one knew for sure, local gossip was that the samurai had been shamed by his promise and being unable to fulfill it. So he walked up to her and cut her down to try to restore his honor. Yeah, feudal Japan was not a very nice place. She was killed in front of a local store and according to this man, it was this door that the prostitute died in front of. Uh-oh. Sure enough, they realize that all of their stories intersect here. Yes, I see what you're doing, Nakayama. My voice may sound sarcastic, but that's actually great storytelling. As they sit, now starting to freak out a bit, another watchman bursts in and tells them that he needs help. A body has been found. A bizarre suicide. It's the samurai, and he topped himself right in front of the door, stabbing himself through with enough force to pin himself to it. And as they stand back, they see that it creates a tableau of the dead samurai with the woman's face biting into his top knot. Huh, great story, and remember it for later because we do come back to it. After a bizarrely out of place and extremely graphic sex scene, Nakayama, mate, were you in a bit of a mood? Which shows Chifuyu and Keita bumping uglies. Also, now I guess we know that Chifuyu likes to be on top. Why did we need to know that exactly? We then cut forward back. You know, I have no bloody idea at this point, and we see her reflecting on that thing from the start of the story. I'm guessing that this is before she met Kata and returned the curse, but drifting off to sleep, she suddenly hears something in the room with her. She opens her eyes only to see a familiar shape standing over her. Holy crap! <sighs> and this is what prompted her to cut her hair off, using the mirror in her bathroom to... <laughs> yep, sleep well tonight, folks. So, that's the first bit of PTSD radio. And yeah, I know, I've skipped a whole bunch of stuff here, some of which may be important or at least resonates with other stories, and I'm almost certainly misunderstanding quite a bit of what's going on. In my defense, this is a very confusing manga, especially due to how out of order it's told. But I won't lie, I love it, and weirdly enough, whenever I reread it, I find that I love it more. It's genuinely terrifying sans any gore or nasty stuff for the 
most part. We'll get there. And aside from a bizarrely out of place study on Chifuyu's titties, this could have fitted into a Shonen magazine. So, what happens next? What exactly is causing all of this weirdness? And how does it all connect to Ogushi Sama? Will it, at any point, start making coherent sense? Well, for that, you'll have to wait until next time. Before we finish up for the day, I want, as always, to give a huge thanks to my fantastic patrons, Astrix Gaming, Cheerful Satanist, Starwin Marwin, High Lord J, who recently went to a Black Whistle status, so thanks mate, Jacob Ramsey, Crazy, Kel Kaur, Lance Goebel, Paul Norberger, Piece of Yeast, Rafferty, Robert Dote, and XTC Pill. If you want to see more like this, why not stick around? Subscribe, bell, you know what to do. If you want to help Mrs. Owl and I out, and ensure that I can keep on doing what I do, why not take a look at our Patreon? In addition to helping us pay the bills, you'll also get some fun perks on the Discord, as well as early access to most of my videos. Oh right, we have a Discord. It's all in the description. Anyway, take care my friends, and cheers. This is The Owl, signing off.